Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Office Hours Great Questions Edition. Boy, I tell you what, y'all are on fire lately with really good questions. So let's hop right to it. If you want to ask your own question, click on the link in the video description, and you can also upvote the uh, questions that you think are great. So the first great question I, I'm really intrigued in because I've been really interested in artificial intelligence lately because I haven't gotten any genuine intelligence out of my audience. Um, so uh, uh, first up is M Matt who says, Hi, Brent. Have you checked out ChatGTP's ability to write SQL code? It's very impressive and in some cases faster than a Stack Overflow question. In fact, Stack Overflow have had to ban people using GBT to answer people's questions. The reason Stack had to ban Chat GPT isn't because people were generating accurate answers so quickly. It's because they were generating inaccurate answers so quickly. Answers. Oh, nah, see, sure enough, Siri pops up. And they were generating inaccurate answers so quickly. Answers that looked accurate until you went just below the surface and tried to actually do them. That's the problem with chat GPT and SQL code right now is that chat GPT has no awareness of your database schema. So it doesn't know, for example, if you have a many to many relationship inside a table or if one table has duplicates in it or how tables are joined together. I have confidence, because of the, the way AI is moving so quickly, I have confidence that within a year or two, somebody's going to say that they brought out chat GPT tools to write SQL code that is aware of your database uh, schema. But I kind of look at it just like how automatic driving, full self-driving from Tesla has been real close now for like five years. These are hard problems to solve. Artificial intelligence generates something that gets you like 80, 90% of the way very quickly, but then that last 10 or 20% is the part that's really hard. Am I excited about the future with artificial intelligence? Absolutely, but just keep an eye on exactly how accurate those answers are, uh, and often they're kind of disappointing. They sound cool, though, the kind of thing that'll get you past a term paper grading. Hadaway asks, do high VLF counts matter when it's in TempDB? So the thing is with TempDB, TempDB starts at a certain size that you configure it, and then it'll gradually grow if you, for example, need a lot of space in a database or you need a lot of space in a log file. The thing that concerns me there is I bet that TempDB was started with a very artificially small size and grew over time which indicates that maybe the SQL Server's been up for a really long time, or the default sizes for TempDB are probably no bueno. The thing that I would start with, is, is VLFs a concern for me? No, but it points to something else. When there's smoke, there's fire. I bet that your TempDB is set up like one gigabyte files and one gigabyte log file, because people think that TempDB space is expensive or whatever. And then, of course, in real usage, you need more space. The thing that I tell my clients to start with is whatever the total size of your data on the server is, you should expect 25% of that to be the size of TempDB. So like if you have one terabyte worth of databases, you should expect 250 gigabytes worth of space to be used by TempDB because people will create objects in there. They'll do index rebuilds online with sort and TempDB equals on, all kinds of stuff like that. And it sounds expensive until you remember, like, this is a two terabyte USB drive, and I, I don't even use this. You notice I could grab it right off my desktop. I, this is my old one, because I just replaced it with a four terabyte one from Amazon. I am by no means saying that you should put TempDB on something like this, but you need to reset expectations for how expensive or inexpensive TempDB grade storage can be, even up in the cloud. Uh, most VM types these days come with ephemeral storage that's like one or two terabytes, depending on the size size of your VM. Next up, Yousef says, is, are GUID data types a good clustered index when concurrent inserts are high? We discuss that and when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense in my mastering index tuning class. There's a module on clustered indexes and it just so happens... <laughs> 
that I have extended the Black Friday sale. So it's on through the rest of the month because I got so many emails from people who are like, my company can't get it done on time. I have so much red tape. And I'm like, all right, all right, I'm going to give you another 30 days. This was actually Erica's idea. And I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to give you another 30 days because I think that if you think that this stuff's on sale for forever, then you'll you know come to think of it as that's the normal price. We ain't going to do this again next year. You're not going to get another 30 days in again next year. So if you want it, go get in now. That gets you the ability to buy my level one bundles, my level two bundles, and so forth at deeply discounted prices. That also is the kind of place where I spend half an hour on that topic, the question that Yusuf just asked. I spend half an hour just on that topic alone in mastering index tuning. So that's a great example of how you know that you're ready for those kinds of mastering level classes. Next up, ProHiller asks, are there any reasons why I shouldn't enable automatic page repairs in my availability groups? Any gotchas that documentation isn't mentioning? Not that I'm aware of. I, I'm not sure what you mean by enable it. I don't think you can disable it. It's something that's built into SQL Server. So if you know about a way to disable it, I'm going to guess that you're probably using a trace flag. I don't do that. Just leave it on. It's on by default for a very good reason. Next up, uh, Dev or Dav DBA says, Hi Brent, I want to do some maintenance work on my server, and I was wondering, do any of the Blitz scripts find invalid objects at a server or database level? I don't know what you mean by invalid objects. I've looked at plenty of my own code in the past and been like, that is an invalid object. Whoever wrote that should be fired. But I don't know what you mean by invalid objects. If you could be more clear about that, that might be able to help. Uh, next up, Wendigo says, when I'm modifying columns in SSMS, why does generate change script like a copy all the data to a new temp table, then swap the tables as opposed to just altering the column directly? There are some changes that you can't make by altering the column directly, and so that's why it ends up doing that. I would strongly encourage you, by the time that you get to that point in your career that you start, start altering existing tables, I would strongly encourage you to do that by hand, to write that T-SQL by hand. Um, that gen generate change script is really like the fastest, easiest way across the finish line. It does not produce the most efficient code. It doesn't check for errors the way that you would want it to. What I would want it to do if I have to copy stuff into a new table is I would want to copy it into a new table, then check what I did to make sure that it works. Whereas as opposed to just hitting F5 and destroying the old table, that would be, as we say in the business, bad. Next up, the purge police says, any tips for identifying all tables that are growing unbounded without retention policies? SP blitz index mode equals two sort order equals rows. That'll give you a list of all the objects in your database sorted by the ones that have the most rows in them. I do this all the time with consulting clients where I'll say, okay, just as I'm getting to know your tables, let's take a quick look at the largest objects. Can you explain what these top three or four largest objects are? And often that identifies surprises to folks right then and there where they're like, oh my God, I had no idea we had that many rows in that table. Or, oh my God, I thought we'd gotten rid of that table. And it's always very funny when people go, oh, I forgot about sales underscore before the backup, you know, or things like that. And then they drop old tables too as well. Hrafnidudler, I'm going to guess that that's Icelandic. Hrafnhildur asks, what SQL prompt features would you like to see included in future versions of Management Studio and Azure Data Studio? I don't see Microsoft making a lot of feature improvements in either of those two products. I know, right? It's, it's kind of a bad thing for me to say. I know I've got friends who work in the tooling teams at Microsoft. I don't see those products getting better quickly. I see them desperately trying to keep up with upgrades to the engine. And I'll give you an example. It is December 12th. SQL Server 22 came out last month, 
SSMS 19 is still in preview. Microsoft hasn't even shipped SQL Server Management Studio 2019, in, not 2019, but 19, that has things that are required to work with SQL Server 2022 and its managed instance integrations. When Microsoft unbold, unbundled Management Studio from SQL Server itself, the idea was supposed to be that Management Studio would be able to, and Azure Data Studio, would be able to ship more quickly so that they could keep up with advancements in the cloud. They're not doing it. So what I would like to see included, is frankly, I would like to see them keep up with the engine. It's kind of a mummer of an answer, I know. Uh, Dr. Ruth says, what are the, <laughs> Dr. Ruth, uh, I wish I could still do a Dr. Ruth impersonation. I used to be able to do that, but it's nowhere near good now. Now it sounds kind of like Julia Childs. Uh, I think they're both passed away. I know Julia Childs is gone. I'm not sure about Dr. Ruth. I would assume so. She was old when she, anyway. What are some recommended techniques for identifying sprocks that are no longer used? I have hundreds of sprocks that are not all used and I would like to clean up. Why? Why? You think anybody's going to notice? Do you think you're going to get a raise at the end of the year? Because people go, oh my God, when I used to open up Management Studio, it used to be a big long line. Now there's only 50 procs. Give Dr. Ruth a raise. Nope. You're going after the wrong thing. Put that down. That's not going to help your career. Because all it takes is dropping the wrong proc once, something that somebody's only using for analysis once a year, and you'll be in trouble. Focus on job duties that will make people happy, where people will go, oh my God, that's an amazing difference. I get the feeling you're looking at this just because you think it's going to be easy and it's going to make you some progress somewhere, and it won't. Next up, Fyodor says, is it ever okay? No. No, Fyodor, it's not. Stop touching the doll there. To use the leading columns of the clustered index as the leading columns are some of the non-clustered indexes. Any gotchas with this? What I would rather ask is what's the problem you're trying to solve? Like I would want to look at the query that you think is going to go faster and measure the logical reads before you put in the non-clustered index and after you put in the non-clustered index. My guess is that the improvement won't be very large and certainly won't justify having two copies of the table. Because now, remember, you have to maintain those with every insert and delete. I've never personally seen a case where the benefit made sense. But I would encourage you to find out by looking at the queries you're trying to make go faster. Uh, next up, Culloden says, I keep seeing Microsoft invest in storage spaces direct. Why would one decide to put SQL Server on commodity hardware? I've only worked at large organizations with large prod servers that use uh, SANS for storage. Well, Culloden, large SANS storage is what you might call expensive. Commodity hardware is what you might call cheap. So while your employers like to invest big money in expensive storage and hire brilliant, attractive, good-smelling people such as yourself, there are a lot of companies that don't, that want to use cheaper uh, grade stuff. And the other way that I would ask it is, what do you think Azure runs on? Do you think, for example, like Azure SQL DB runs on big enterprise grade SANS? Of course not. They need to keep prices down. You look at things like anything that Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft do, Netflix. For things like commodity grade uh, hardware, it just makes so much more sense once you start talking about cloud uh, grade. I am not talking about, I'm not saying that there's no case uh, in which not to use large SANS. I love enterprise, enterprise grade storage. The ability to take a snapshot of a multi-terabyte database and instantly present it to another server is baller. I love it. But a lot of people just don't need that, and so that's why they continue to invest in it. Great question. So, Coffee Table says, Hello, what are the gotchas with doing hourly incremental loads to a data warehouse rather than a single overnight load? The, the problem with uh, hourly loads is that anytime you go about 5,000 rows, and I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit here, 
when you go above about 5,000 rows locked in a table, you can escalate up to table level locking. Well, if you're doing loads of a data warehouse, it's real easy to blow past 5,000 locks, and you really don't want to be locking the data warehouse tables 24 times a day if you're doing uh, hourly loads. So because of that, that once you start doing hourly loads, you have to be way more cognizant of locking and blocking. Can you do it? Yes, absolutely. It just requires way more work. And statistics are the least of your problems. Lots of great questions there. Good round there. Good job, everybody. And I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.